You are not alone. Yes, you're sitting on gobs and gobs of data, but lots of customers are. We have one in Canada. We took all of your data. They knew there was information in there, insights they could draw out. They just didn't know how. That's where machine learning came in, where we can start to find things that you didn't even realize were there. We've got Lauren back on the show. It's going to be great. This is the next episode of Dev Radio. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Microsoft Dev Radio. I'm your host, Jerry Nixon, and I'm excited to talk to you today about some real-life machine learning. And who else to talk to us about real-life machine learning than the one and only Lauren Tran. Lauren Tran, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, Lauren, it's always a treat to have you on, and it's just great to be a colleague of yours. Now, Lauren, and even better, you just came over towards my team. It was great. You I were did, over on the, yes. The startup team, and uh -huh. now you're here. That's great. Yeah. Um, uh, Lauren, uh, it is possible, I suppose, that somebody hasn't watched a previous episode with you, and I think you should be the regular guest, no doubt about <laughs> it. Just in case somebody doesn't know who you are, who are you, Lauren? Yeah, so my name is Lauren Tran. I am a software engineer based out of the Bay Area in California, and I've been at Microsoft for almost four years now, and I work on ML projects. So that's the majority of the time that I spend here doing really cool machine learning projects. Um, you know, they're always really different. It's a dynamic thing, and it's something I really love to do. And um, you do it so well because you're so disarming to people whenever you talk about this. <laughs> because when you think about machine learning, it's a sophisticated thing. There's a lot of, there's several moving parts, but mathematically speaking, and from the algorithm's point of view, it's, uh, you know, this is pretty a, a daunting hill for a lot of people to approach. It can be, yes. So there is a lot of math behind the scenes, but Microsoft has done a really great job of putting together kind of a suite of services that allows it to be a little bit more approachable um, from sort of all the way from the data scientist and the researcher to the developer to someone who's kind of just starting to dabble in that. Yeah. yeah, and it's pretty great because I think a lot of people who are looking at machine learning because, you know, if you, I mean, now you're reading articles and the, the cover ma um, of the magazine says, you know, if your business isn't considering machine learning, then you're way behind yep. the curve, right? Yep. This, is the, this is the assumed normal. This isn't mm -hmm. some sort of weird science fiction project that you're going into. And, you know, a lot of people approach this. They're like, holy moly, I have to become a data scientist. And that's just not the truth, is it? It's not. It's not. You can accomplish a lot without actually having done, you know, graduate work research in this field. So um, there are places to go. There are resources. And, and this is, you know, Microsoft's position in this field is about, it's about democratizing AI and making it approachable for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like we did for analysis services, just like we did for databases. It's yep. great what we do. Absolutely. Now, um, we worked with a real uh, customer here. And that is Connexus Credit Union. And Clark, you are on the call as well. Thanks for coming on the show today. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, you're not in Seattle, are you? No, I'm not. All right. Tell us, tell us who you are and, well, where you are. Well, I'm a software developer, and I'm one of a team of five at Connexus Credit Union, so a pretty small little organization. Um, I physically, I'm the only one in my physical location. I'm in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. So okay. shout out to all those people. Um, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, well, there's actually snow outside my window if I were to open it. So, yeah. oh, fabulous. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, I'm, uh, I wrote a note down. I said, I'm a curious misfit with a few technical skills. So that's how you can describe me. Wow. That is your elevator pitch for yourself, right? There. That's it. <laughs> All right. You curious misfit, you. All right. So you are a software developer for Connexus. Gotcha. And as this project kind of spun up and you, we recognize there's a certain amount of data that you want to have some sort of uh, problem solved, you were the one chosen for this project to work with us. That's right. <laughs> it sounds way more dramatic than that, <laughs> the way you say it. But yes. Ah, so. yes. Once you, once you cured cancer, then what are you going to do the rest <laughs> yeah. of your life? That's exactly That's right. right. <laughs> cool. Now, I want to learn more about the project, but we also have Yvonne on the, on the uh, show as well. Avon, thanks for joining us. You're coming all the way from the Microsoft Universe. What town are you in? I'm based out of Vancouver, Canada. 
Okay. I'm program manager with our commercial software engineering team. So my job is really working with customers and partners to help them figure out how to use Azure and other emerging technologies we have to address their business needs. Terrific. All right. So talk to me just a little bit about this project with Conexus. Uh, so digital transformation has obviously been top of mind in the financial industry. And we got involved uh, not just with Conexus, but with the large credit union coalition in Canada, mm -hmm. which included uh, 15 largest uh, credit unions here in Canada, including obviously Conexus. Okay. So the credit unions approached us because they were interested in figuring out how to start generating and nurturing different uh, technology ideas across their organization to improve the lives of their customers. And they looked to, customer, uh, they looked to Microsoft to support them in this initiative. So we okay. started off, yeah. We started off with the hackathon where uh, representatives from all the different credit unions came together, formed teams, and brainstormed uh, different solution ideas uh, with the objective of improving their members' financial well-being. And from all the ideas, uh, the idea that uh, Clark and his team worked on was chosen as the winner. And that's when we brought in Lauren and her team to help uh, uh, help the credit unions um, actually building this out and turning it into reality. Okay, Clark, tell me, what was the business problem you were solving? Okay, so um, uh, uh, first of all, I should actually explain that uh, I'm not sure. Were you there, Yvonne? I don't remember you. I remember some of the. I remember. Um, <laughs> some of the other people there, but we had a lot of broken ideas laying on the floor before we came to this idea. So we're sitting there on day two and no good ideas. The ideas just kept getting rejected. And we all were just saying, you know, isn't it terrible, you know, when a member is sitting there and they're in a, some kind of financial difficulty and, uh, and then something, something happens and we just, you know, come down hard on them, right? You know, they, they, they foreclose, we foreclose on them. And, it, and it's like, wouldn't it be something if we could actually figure out when that person is approaching that and try to actually help them before they reach that really terrible place? And so we named this, this idea Project We Care. And basically, the idea was, can we use machine learning to look at transactions only? Because there's some serious privacy issues of throwing demographics and stuff into, into the mix. So sort of like, well, just using transactions, can we just actually find out if a person is headed towards a negative experience or not? And then the idea is then to go and find ways to actually help them before they hit that. So that's the, the name of the project, Project We Care. I can and see so, why you called it that. That's pretty yeah. great. So it was, we, all of us, none of us, I think uh, me and Desmond had read a bit about it. Uh, Jamie is very much a database wonk. So we were all in our happy place for data, but we'd never actually done it before. And Adam was a, uh, a marketing guy, definitely wanted to see something coming out, out of this. And so we put this together and we said, can we just drill transactions and find out if a person is actually you know, going to a negative place in, in their relationship with the organization or not? All right, well, th this is perfect. So this takes us right to the first question every machine learning project starts to ask. And Lauren, uh, how do you deal with it when, um, or how do you make the decision and the determination whether or not you have enough data to really be able to use machine learning in the first place? Because I know a lot of times we'll, we'll talk to customers or businesses and they'll be like, we have a great idea, but we only have transactional data. Or sometimes they'll say, we have tons of data. Um, how, do you, how do you determine whether machine learning is the, is the right solution and they've got enough data? That's a great question. So the first thing that I will always do is take their data and try to get it into a form to feed into an algorithm. So a lot of times the, the type of data that they have is not something that can strictly in its raw form be fed into a machine lear learning algorithm. So we'll do something called feature engineering, which is taking that data and structuring it in such a way that you can actually give it to an algorithm. And what I will do is take uh, that structured data that's structured specifically for an algorithm, pass it through an algorithm and see if the data is separable. And when I say mm. separable, that means um, can the algorithm tell uh, is it one thing or is it another thing? And sometimes it's not separable. Sometimes it's in a situation where the algorithm really can't draw a line through it or make a decision between where does this data go. And so there are some t techniques that you can use to kind of solve for that. 
but um, an initial pass through is to see if we can engineer some features. And when I say features, I mean characteristics um, of user behavior in this scenario that we can uh, feed to. All right, so them. let's pretend yeah. we're feature engineering, which is uh -huh. a big term, by the way. Yeah. All right, we can engineer some features. What's sure. the kind of feature you might find in a project like this? Yeah, so um, in this specific uh, scenario, like Clark said, he wanted to use just transactions. So in a scenario, if, if I'm looking at this blind, I might think, before I knew about privacy concerns, I might think things like demographics. So the age of the person, um, where they, you know, what is the balance of their accounts to other things like that, but that's not something that they wanted to actually use. Right. So, so we have transaction data. And the way to get it that into a form that you um, can actually feed into an algorithm is to do something um, where you aggregate that data. And we're dealing with time here. So that sort of an extra component that you have to take into consideration. So what we did was decided, hey, let's try to capture user activity over time. So mm -hmm. can we capture an aggregate over a week of what they did in different transaction categories? And then we'll, we'll stack many, many weeks together and kind of concatenate those things together to capture a snapshot of how these users are behaving and what is their transaction patterns and activity. All right, so in a way, yeah. you're kind of creating new data because they give you this stream of transactions Correct. and you say, well, let's create a week. We don't have that as a real data point. Yes. Let's create a week data point. Exactly, oh, exactly. And we did experiment with a couple of different um, fixed time frames. So um, we said, hey, let's uh, take a look at months um, or days, but we found that weeks worked really well in being just sort of, it, it wasn't too small, it wasn't too big, it was just the right amount of time to be able to um, capture what it looks like typically that that user will do week over week. Got it. All right. So, Clark, it sounds like we started looking at your data, started finding things, and I assume that Conexus chose you because you were the resident data scientist. No, I wasn't. Um, in fact, they had to take me out of retirement. So uh, when it comes, I'm, I'm building apps now, right? I, I had at one time managed our database servers, um, you know, and done various database stuff. I didn't do support for our business intelligence uh, sometimes. But yeah, I had to go back and dig and swim in our data and try to figure out what end was up on certain things. So I, I have to give a real, um, uh, like a shout out to all the BI and the database people in, my, in, in the credit union because I was blowing up, you know, our dev servers, you know, filling them full of data and trying to figure out how to do this. And they were just, they just, they just kept helping me, even though, you know, they didn't, I should say they didn't have to, but, you know, like they have lots of things on their plates. So it was, it was awesome. So anyway, we did get this humongous matrix that Lauren basically asked us for. And, um, and in a couple of different varieties, like you asked for monthly, um, you know, and weekly, and we found the weekly worked best. I did not believe Lauren when she told me that the data had a signal in it. Like, this is even before, like, we got there. So I gave her the data, right? And she said, yeah, there's a signal in the data, no worry. And I'm like, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, you know. And um, I did have to see it, and then I believed it. <laughs> it was awesome. The, now, uh, Lauren, what's the, what is usually the first handful of steps when you're starting to approach a project like this? Yeah, so the very, very first step is to get the data from the customer or partner, and that needs to happen well in advance. Um, so it, it, the first step is for me to get an idea of what type of data they have. And then when, once I have an idea of their data schema and what we have available to us, then I can start thinking about, okay, what are the characteristics that are going to pop? or what do I think is going to work. And so sometimes I'll take a look at scholarly articles and see what has been done that, that can work. But much of the magic of machine learning is getting um, that data right. The, something, it's something called a feature vector. So if you can describe every member in your database um, in terms of a single row and, and characteristics about them, then that's, that's your end state goal as far as uh, feature engineering. So the magic is in building the right type of um, feature vector with the right schema, and that's when you're going to get that signal. So, you know, there's a lot of back and forth with Clark and, and, and the team at LCUC, and um, we, we discussed, you know, various different things, and we went back and forth on this. 
Um, and, and it was, you know, for me, a lot of times it is intuition. I've done a lot mm -hmm. of these projects, and so I'll get a sense for what I think is going to work. And then, you know, Clark gets me over the data. I'll run it through a classifier, and, you know, I, I'm like, hey, that actually really worked. That's awesome, and that means I did my oh, job. Oh, very yeah. nice. So yeah. sometimes there is a little bit of human learning where there is machine learning. So this idea yeah. of signal in the uh -huh. data yeah. is kind of where, this is where Lauren detects that there's a pattern. <laughs> and sometimes you'll be surprised. Sometimes there are things that um, are going to create a signal that you don't necessarily think. But we found that uh, the transaction behavior of members who are going to default versus not are radically different. It's highly separable. A an algorithm can determine the difference between those two things very easily. So think of it as a footprint. You want to always capture a footprint of the thing that you are trying to analyze and reason about. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, let's step away from Conexus for a second, sure. Lauren. Um, yeah. A lot of projects, I know we get started only to realize that the data isn't there, only to realize that the question they're asking doesn't match the data yeah. they're providing. And then there's this magical moment when they do provide the right data, right. and even better when there are these signals inside it. Yes. What's, what's the next step for a developer? Uh, where do they begin as far as things like uh, tooling and services? What's, what's, walk me through the kind of the checkbox list. For once they have the data and they have their business problem, yeah, I, I would say so. So that's the that's the very first thing. Is oftentimes, like you said, Jerry, we you and I have been on projects like this before, where maybe there's a scenario that they think is a machine learning scenario, and it's actually not. Maybe it can be solved with a SQL query, yeah. but um, yeah. or maybe there's another way of doing it. Machine learning is a hammer that's not always the right tool. So um, it it really starts with um, what question are you trying to ask of the data, and there's a certain class, a certain um, set of questions that you can ask from data. And so a lot of times it will be a little bit of education. So um, someone comes to me with a potential scenario, I'll say, um, what are you trying to ask? And we'll ascertain um, if this is an ML scenario or if there's another way that you should do that. And yeah. once you actually, you know, come up with your business use case that is a machine learning problem, I think that there are a lot of good ways to kind of get started. So one of the things I will do often is um, take something like Azure ML Studio, which is this really great graphical interface where you can kind of drag and drop different machine learning modules. And that's a really great tool for both education and for prototyping. So I can go in there and in 15 minutes I'll know if the data is separable. I all know if we can build something or not. Um, so that's a really great tool to get started with. And after that, um, there are a lot of different libraries that have great documentation. So okay. things like Scikit-Learn, um, Keras is a great uh, API uh, layer over some deep learning libraries like TensorFlow or CNTK. So many, many different resources. Um, Okay, yeah. so there's a lot going on here. Yeah, we, yeah. One of the neat starting places, at least in the Microsoft world, right? Mm -hmm. we, we get to start with Azure ML Studio like you just told us, yes. which is yeah. handy because there's nothing to install, right? It's just web-based. Right. Uh, Clark, uh, had you had any experience with uh, ML Studio before this? No, they gave us the keys to it, and we ran out of time to actually go in there because I was doing all the data prep and because um, I wanted to, but it turned out <laughs> like... We walked in, Lauren, I'm trying to remember now, Lauren, exactly how many minutes it was between when we walked in and you actually showed us the results. It, it was <laughs> like, it was like super, super quick. And, and it was like, really? You know, like, and I, I, you know, you could, I think there was a little bit of disbelief. And so we all had to do it ourselves, you know, and, yeah. and everything. And I think you gave us a little bit of a prep beforehand. So if you wouldn't have done that, uh, we'd have just seen it right there. It was like, it was pretty awesome. And then I guess there was icing on top of the icing for me in that. So we got the data, and um, we, got our, we got our results, and then uh, Lauren started showing us things. Well, okay, now, if you want to take this farther, you want to pull this out, you can do stuff with Python, and she started showing us all these different things. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of like, okay, we've got all these options now here. And, well, also, sorry, uh, I, got, I remember uh, getting pretty uh, excited about seeing the web services. So that oh, was yeah. pretty cool. You can instance, you know, put a web service together. And now you just start getting your, your data into it and getting results. Oh, you mean uh, just adding an endpoint to yeah. your model so you can yeah. reference yeah. it directly? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I hadn't, nice. yeah, I hadn't expected that. I was just like, oh, you can do that, right? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, i got to go get Visual Studio out and got to start building something that will consume that, right? You know, and and um, it was pretty cool, a pretty cool moment. 
Yeah. Well, it's a great moment when the feature you didn't expect is actually there yeah. versus when the feature you did expect is not there. So that's a, <laughs> that's a pleasant yeah. experience for sure. Um, I tell you what, this tooling is pretty fascinating. Lauren, could you just give us a quick overview of it? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Happy to do that. So let me start sharing my screen now. All right, Lauren, I can see your screen. Awesome. So this is the Azure Machine Learning Studio, and this is the graphical interface that uh, Clark and I were talking about before, where you can actually drag and drop different machine learning modules, and it's a really great tool for education and, and some quick prototyping. So as you can see here, I've got a, a canvas here, and I've got an experiment on that, and this is my training experiment. Um, on the left-hand side, there are many different modules. So if I go into something like machine learning, then I'll see um, my under models, I'll see different types of models. So these are four different classes of algorithms. We happen to be handling a classification scenario where we were trying to classify whether members of the credit union were likely to default or not. So naturally, that's going to be a two-class um, classification algorithm. And naturally, so it is. Yeah. Of course. Now, yeah. this is interesting. Uh -huh. I'm looking at all of these two-class algorithms, mm -hmm. and I yep. see um, that they, um, they're all just built there. So this is where you're saying you don't have to be a mathematician to yes. take advantage of ML on, inside Studio. And yep. so let, let's back up in Studio. And so sure. there's, I see three things here. I see the, this tree on the left that you're kind of walking mm -hmm. through all the things that you can add to the canvas. The yep. canvas is there in the middle, and then the details of whatever it is you have selected is in the properties dialog on the right. Yes, so, that's correct. Talk to me about what's in the middle. It looks a little bit like a Visio diagram Yep, I'm uh -huh. going from top to bottom. Yeah, yep. So you're going from top, top to bottom. So data comes in through the top and it continues down through where these arrows go and continues down out through the bottom. Got so it. so here we have um, the LCUC data that, that they've provided to us that I can just um, add by uh, clicking new going data set and, and searching for a, a local file and bringing and, that in. Uh, all, all you're really looking for is just a simple CSV file, nothing yes. special, yep. no yep. special format. Exactly. So a CSV file, and this is after we've done the feature engineering um, yeah. on this data. And so um, I won't oh, go into... Now that's a really yeah. good point. Uh -huh. So it's not inside ML Studio that you're going to massage your data. Now I do see you have edit made at metadata, so you may uh -huh. do you know, change a column. But as far as massaging your data and working up weeks and all that stuff, that yeah. all happened before, right? Yes, so that happens um, on Clark's site. So Clark okay. handed me with, uh, he had gone through and done SQL queries to export the data in, in, the, in the form that we wanted. Got it. And so um, the data set yeah. he gave you clearly has too many columns. And so you, the second one in this workflow, you pare it down to only the columns you care about. Certain columns, yep. And, and we'll go through and, and edit metadata. So here I'm changing um, uh, a specific column called the goal column that is labeled one or zero based on whether they've defaulted or not. Um, I want to tell Azure ML Studio that that is categorical. That's okay. not a number. You should treat that as a category. It's, it's binary zero or one. It's not something where you should uh, make a prediction that's like 0.5 because those numbers don't actually mean anything other than they're Got just it. a category. So you'll um, have to do that from time to time for a lot of things. And yes. I, I don't see it, but as far as editing metadata, mm -hmm. you could have um, injected another um, item. What do we call the things? What are those little boxes? They're not called little boxes. Are These they? are modules. Modules. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's also a module where you could run your own R script or your own sure. uh, Python, yep. right? And, and yep, do some absolutely. extra manipulation if you needed to. Absolutely. So if I go um, to execute Python script, then if I click on that module, then I can add in my Python code in here into this little editor here. So this is, you know, by default, it's in importing pandas as, as PD, and that is a library that allows you to, to create something called data frames, which are matrices. Um, and, and much of what we do in machine learning is matrix uh, manipulation. So that's what that's for. Um, okay. Yeah. And now, uh, now, a lot of people might think, okay, if I introduce too much of this upfront kind of work in Python script, it's going to slow uh -huh. down my model. Talk to me about how the model how, how the model runs and which part is actually running. Yeah, so um, when you actually run this, it will uh, queue up and it will just it, it will distribute this onto um, a, a, a node in Azure. So the compute will happen in Azure. That's obscured away from you. Um, the Python shouldn't slow down your your code any more than I mean, unless you make it unnecessarily um, complex. But in in 
in, in machine learning, a lot of times um, when you're working with Python, you want to strip things out. You, you want to use as few for loops as you can. And um, that's the point of being able to uh, take uh, variables and extract them as, as vectors or matrices and do matrix operations as opposed to um, iterative operations through for loops. So it really right. depends on how you write your code. Now, uh, Lauren, uh, uh -huh. I see you normalize the data. Now it yep. looks like the data is going everywhere. Yep, so I've got a lot of stuff going on here. Um, I want you to kind of focus on, on uh, this, this, just this critical path here. Um, okay. I've done some extra stuff over here, but the, the key pieces here are normalizing the data. So what you do, the reason to normalize data is because it, it, it allows um, the algorithm to converge faster most of the time. So when an algorithm is training and trying to map um, input x to some variable y, um, it does this thing called gradient descent. And gradient descent is essentially minimizing the error. Um, okay. nor and normalizing your data is going to project uh, your, your data points um, into a different scale that will allow that process to, to, to go a little bit faster. Okay, um, got it. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of people skip that step, so that's great yes, just to yes, improve yep. your... And you know you don't have to do it, but it, it, it is the best best practice, and it will often uh, yeah speed that computation up. So it, it changes it changes the the uh, the calculus and and the math behind gradient descent a little bit. Um, and then we go into the process of, of splitting our data. So the reason to split the data is we need um, some portion of the data to train our model on and some portion to test to see how well that model did. Um, and so typically I'll take something like 70% of the data and I can configure that here on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. um, and then I can drag, so this is that 70% and I can drag that into um, this module called train model which I connect any of those um, modules I showed you earlier, those two class mod modules sure. into, uh, train it, score it, and evaluate. Um, and so, so that's the workflow in Azure ML Studio, and, um, this, and this is something that is a really great tool for quick prototyping. I can get to my results very quickly. If I um, click on um, evaluate, then I should be able to see here. Um, the the closer your uh, curve is, the hugs the the left vertical axis and goes across the right axis, the better. Um, a lot of times, I mean, this tells me this, this data is highly separable. Sometimes when you get so close to the top and it's perfect, you you that might cause a little bit of suspicion. Like, sure. oh, did I do something a little wrong? Um, in this case, and what a, it, what a yeah. great takeaway, Lauren, that you're not looking for perfect because if you actually get to perfect. You've probably done it wrong. It, there's there's a chance that you left something in there that is um, that that one to one maps to your the output label that you want. And so um, I, you know I, I did this and I, I was thinking to myself, okay, did I do something wrong? Went back um, and and in fact this data is so clearly separable that it's actually not in there. So. This, is, it's, it's, this is a dream project. <laughs> it is. It is. This doesn't happen very often. So um, it, it's a dream project. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. It's a dream project. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that, that was our, uh, actually, um, let me show you one more thing. If I click back into that and scroll down a little bit, then we can see some metrics here. So um, accuracy at 90%, um, some other metrics that um, give you an indicator of how well you've done. Um, but, and obviously, yeah. here you have accuracy better than precision. That's what you ultimately want. You want it to be as, well, as accurate as possible. Yes, and, and precision uh, is something that you should look at, but uh, the, these are all, this all tells a story. So it's something to, to take a look at, understand what these things mean. And, and you know, for specific use cases, you, you have to understand what can my um, false positive and false negative rate be. Um, is, is it a scenario like, you know, the, the, the court of law scenario where, it, you know, innocent until proven guilty, you better be sure that that person is guilty before you put them in jail, right? And so what, what, out, out of curiosity, yeah. Lauren, what, um, what number in true positive would you want before you sent somebody to jail? <laughs> <laughs> so so you, want, you want as few false positives as possible. So you want to make sure your false positive rate is extremely low and trade on, and fa trade on false negatives. So, um, adjusting the slider here 
will do that. If I, if I want um, no false positives, um, that, that affects my accuracy a lot. A so lot. so you, you got to really kind of think about your business problem. Sure. When, when you're making that determination. But and maybe it's a, some... It's a great expectation, yeah. too, because, I mean, you want an accuracy that's well above, let's say, 80%, and, <laughs> and some manageable number below you know, 100%. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is Azure Studio. Yes. Uh, and it is a quick place to prototype, but it's uh -huh. also where you would put a final model that you would execute in production. Sure. As well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we can go ahead. You, you could set this up as a web service. Um, and what that will do is give you a final endpoint. So um, I won't go through those steps right now. But, right. It basically uh, it, skips yeah. that part where you go and find a, a file instead uh -huh. of passing a file to some REST endpoint. Right, exactly. So um, what you would do is it would expect uh, the, exactly, so if I go into my predictive experiment here, um, then uh, it will expect, the web service input will expect the same data schema that I had before. So um, data comes in here, it goes through the same process, and then out comes the data. Yeah, the model so, looks quite a bit simpler in this part. Yes, so so they're collapsing things. They're they're changing things from. Um, it'll take that model and wrap it up as the, as a saved model here. Um, LCUC default classification. So that's the studio in a nutshell. Um, we we also solved this using um, Azure uh, ML Workbench um, using Python. So so there are some uh, some things we did in here as well. If if we want to go through them. Brilliant. Now, yeah. uh, this, this seems pretty approachable. Yeah, I don't uh -huh. have to be a mathematician. Clark, nope. you're not a mathematician. You're just nope. a software developer just like yeah. me. Um, is it as easy as Lauren makes it sound? Yeah, it really is. It was, uh, it was actually, I, I took a few runs at it in order to make sure that I actually wasn't being bamboozled, <laughs> so to speak. You know? But no, it's, it's, it, it's the real thing. And then the icing on top of the icing was then she was able to get us uh, into the, like if we, if we want to operationalize something, it's a little more difficult because we, we're uh, multiple credit unions and we want to figure out how to add all the data together. And so there's, there, well, there's a lot of these different options with Python and with Workbench. So It's cool to me that this kind of tooling is available to make projects that otherwise would be unbelievably complex pretty simple to solve. Uh, Yvonne, uh, when you look at a project like this and you see it being delivered to a customer, uh, how satisfied are you? This, this experience has been extremely satisfying. First, you know, we were working on an engagement, an initiative that really not just benefited one individual business, but across 15 different credit unions and all of their members and the fact that we can use machine learning technologies to, to solve the problem that wasn't solvable before. That was, that was like Clark said, the icing on top of the icing. The icing on top of the icing. Clark, you've, that's a lot of icing. If uh, developers listen to this, um, what do you tell them? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, just jump in, I guess. Uh, like. I, you know, actually, I, I really appreciated having this hands-on. It was, it was really good. Um, but you could have logged in. They gave us the keys to Azure before this thing, and uh, I was doing a lot of data prep. But I could have dug around, and I probably would have gotten even more out of it, you know, like, you know, from that. But, uh, but still, it's all there. You know, you drag and drop your files into this thing, and, and you're sort of like, uh, I'm supposed to write some code somewhere. Come on. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. It's funny because you can tell somebody to go bone up on machine learning, and it seems like that means to go get a PhD, but that's not what it means anymore. It really means uh, how can we use these toolings where all these, honestly, very smart people have prepared it and made it simple so that we could just be yeah. almost code figure it more than um, anything else. We're not needing to code into it as well. Now, a couple of developers, Lauren, might be pretty inspired by this. They are looking for resources that you might point them to so okay. that they can learn more and get started. Where do you send people you Usually. Yeah, so I'll send them one good, great landing place is Microsoft.com slash AI, and that will have links to our AI suite. So there's things across the board that you can take a look at. Um, if you want to get deeper, I always recommend that um, there are some courses out there. So on Coursera.com, Andrew Ng's course is very, very good. He's got a traditional machine learning course and a deep learning course. Um, Fast AI is a really good uh, upskilling 
uh, tool as well, a uh, website with lots of different um, courses on, on deep learning. So there, there's a spectrum of how deep you want to get in this. How deep you want to get. And it's, what's great is, in a handful of days, uh, Clark's become very productive, and it's gone from zero to hero pretty fast. Meanwhile, yeah. It's pretty handy having, you know, not all of us have a master's in machine learning, so it is sort of cool to have Lauren sitting around too. And uh, it's neat because most companies are sitting on a lot of data. Most companies have a lot of, un a lot of answerable questions if they know how to kind of pull it out of their data, kind of create those features, you know, as they go through it as well. If you're a software developer and you've been hearing about Microsoft machine learning, you've been hearing about just machine learning in general and you're wondering how you can tap into it as well, the number of resources that are free, frankly, are astronomical. And if you don't go get an Azure subscription and try machine learning for free, you're crazy because it's crazy approachable. And thank you, Clark, for proving that that's true. You're welcome. <laughs> you bet. Thanks for being on the show, Clark. Thanks, Yvonne. Thanks for being on the show. Cool. And thank you. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> You're very welcome, Clark. Yeah. It was a pleasure working with you. Yeah. We'll see you Always again. Always good. Yeah.